Thank you for that, for the introduction. We're really glad to be here. I thank you, God, for most this amazing day, for the leaping greenly spirits of trees and a blue true dream of sky and for everything which is natural, which is infinite, and which is yes. This poem by E.E. E. Cummings is a favorite of mine, and my daughter Rachel, too, loved the poetry of E.E. E. Cummings. On this most amazing day, in this beautiful community, that's brimming with the leaping greenly spirits of trees and the blue true dream of sky, it is heartening and hopeful to Craig and me to gather with all of the people who have come uh, this weekend. And I feel sure you have come because of your own commitment to justice and peace in the world. Though the issue of Israel-Palestine is a challenging one, and the feelings surrounding it are passionate, I know. I, I believe that today we have all come wanting to learn, to discuss with one another, and ultimately to act with the intention of making the world truly a better place for every part of our human family. I hope and I believe that we all very much come here in the spirit of yes, as E.E. E. Cummings put it. In her fifth grade yearbook, Rachel wrote, I want to be a lawyer, a dancer, an actress, a mother, a wife, a children's author, a distance runner, a poet, a pianist, a pet store owner, an astronaut, an environmental and humanitarian <laughs> activist, a psychiatrist, a ballet teacher, and the first woman president. <laughs> Rachel grew up in Olympia, Washington, where we, we raised our family and where Craig and I live now. She loved Seattle and the mountains, the forest and the sea. She was a writer. And as a college student, she wrote about where we live in Western Washington State. She said, studying the history of this area roots me. It makes me more conscious of the land and more conscious of myself and of the people around me as actors in history. Studying local history is motivating. We certainly waded in the same water and wandered on the same beaches as very brave people. It makes bravery seem more possible, something that can occur on the forest roads around the Skokomish. She wrote of Perry Creek, which is a quiet stream that flows out of the hills near our house. And she said, in the summer, the rushes grow so tall you can hide in them and be completely invisible. This is where I came from, tunnels through rushes. I could spend all the light hours of all the days in tunnels through rushes in the middle of the estuary at the mouth of Perry Creek. This is where I came from, and this is where I would have liked to stay, sunburned and hidden and close to water, making up whole pretend histories about shipwrecks and Swiss Family Robinson. But Rachel went to Rafa. Rachel's response to 9-11 was to become very involved in the peace movement in Olympia. She was drawn to Palestine and Israel by people in Olympia, where we lived, by an Israeli woman now living there whose family members survived the Holocaust, who grew up and lived in Israel for 29 years, served in the military, and became a powerful voice against the Israeli occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. Rachel was impacted by activists who had spent years in the West Bank and like people at this conference had then come back to the United States and couldn't forget what they had seen and so continued their work on this issue. And she was impacted by local ISM, International Solidarity Movement volunteers who in the summer of 2002 traveled to the West Bank and Gaza to join Palestinians in nonviolent direct action resistance to the occupation. Rachel learned from all of these people. She expanded her own study of the Israeli-Palestinian-U.S. conflict and began learning Arabic. She wrote, why do I want to go? 
I've been organizing in Olympia for a little over a year on anti-war global justice issues. And at some point, it started to feel like this work is missing a solid connection to the people who are most immediately impacted by US foreign policy. I feel pretty isolated from the world in some ways because of living in Olympia my whole life. So I've had this underlying need to go to a place and meet people who are on the other end of the portion of my tax money that goes to fund the US and other militaries. Rachel arranged her life to finance her own trip to Palestine, and in January of 2003, frightened but determined, she left our family home in Olympia, traveled to David Ben-Gurion Airport in Israel, and made her way to the West Bank for training with the International Solidarity Movement, ISM. In remarks at the United Nations in 2002, Huweda Arab, who is one of the co-founders of ISM, this Palestinian-led resistance movement, <clears throat> noted that there are only two stipulations for joining. One must believe in the right to freedom of the Palestinian people based on the relevant United Nations resolutions and international law, and one must agree to use only nonviolent direct action methods of resistance. Ms. Arif added that the strength of ISM activists is not in arms. Their strength is in the truth and justice of the Palestinian cause and in believing that Palestinian people deserve equal rights. Rachel went to Rafa at the southernmost tip of Gaza. If we had our PowerPoint, we'd be showing you some maps because she believed that this place had been <clears throat> forsaken. She recognized that there was danger. When she first called home on her cell phone, there was fear in her voice, and we, Craig and I, could hear the trembling in her voice as she asked us if we could hear the shelling that was coming towards the house along the border strip uh, with Egypt that was being created by the Israeli military. And Craig and I, in fact, could hear that shelling as we listened in Olympia. <coughs> then Rachel's emails began, and she began to open our eyes. I have been in Palestine for two weeks and one hour now, and I still have very few words to describe what I see. It is most difficult for me to think about what's going on here when I sit down to write back to the United States, something about the virtual portal into luxury. I don't know if many of the children here have ever existed without tank shell holes in their walls and towers of an occupying army surveying them constantly from the near horizons. I think, although I'm not entirely sure, that even the smallest of these children understand that life is not like this everywhere. An eight-year-old was shot and killed by an Israeli tank two days before I got here, and many of the children murmur his name to me, Ali, or point at the posters of him on the walls. Love you, really miss you. I have bad nightmares about tanks and bulldozers outside our house and you and me inside. Sometimes the adrenaline acts as an anesthetic for weeks and then in the evening or at night it just hits me again, a little bit of the reality of the situation. I am really scared for the people here. Nadal's English gets better every day. He's the one who calls me my sister. He started teaching grandmother how to say, hello, how are you, in English. You can always hear the tanks and bulldozers passing by, but all of these people are genuinely cheerful with each other and with me. Rachel told us that going to Gaza was one of the most important things that she had done with her life. With other activists, she spent nights sleeping at wells to protect them from demolition. She stood between Palestinian municipal water workers who were trying to repair wells that had been damaged and destroyed, and the Israeli military towers from where shots would ring down, harassing the workers and the internationals. She documented the destruction of Palestinian olive orchards and gardens and greenhouses, as well as harassment of Palestinians at checkpoints. She learned Arabic from the children and helped them with their English homework. She drank a great deal of sweet tea with Palestinian grandmothers. 
and held wiggling babies and danced with the children. And she wrote, know that I have a lot of very nice Palestinians looking after me. I have a small flu bug and got some very nice lemony drinks to cure me. Also, the woman who keeps the key for the well where we sleep keeps asking me about you. She doesn't speak a word of English, but she asks about my mom pretty frequently, wants to make sure I'm calling you. On March 16, 2003, Rachel was brutally crushed by an Israeli Defense Forces Caterpillar D9 R bulldozer as she stood between that bulldozer and a Palestinian home threatened with demolition. Members of the family who owned the home, two brothers, a pharmacist and an accountant, their wives and their five young children watched through a crack in their garden wall as the bulldozer approached. Between September 2000 and September 2004, over 1,700 homes in Rafah were threatened and eventually demolished as Israeli occupation forces cleared a wide buffer strip and constructed a large steel wall along Rafah's border with Egypt. Uh, I just would point out that when you read about the wall in um, media reports and so forth, that wall is in the West Bank. And very few people are aware that there was at the same time a wall being constructed along the border with Egypt. And this was between uh, the Palestinian city of Rafa and Egypt. More than 10% of the population of Rafa lost their homes during these demolitions. Most of these people were refugees. Many were dispossessed for a second or third time. Human Rights Watch, in their report, Raising Rafa, Mass Home de Demolitions in the Gaza Strip, stated in 2004, the pattern of destruction strongly suggests that Israeli forces demolish home, homes wholesale, regardless of whether they posed a specific threat in violation of international law. In most of the cases, Human Rights Watch found the destruction was carried out in the absence of military necessity. The Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions, the organization with which Jeff Halper is connected, and you'll be hearing from Jeff later in the, in the <coughs> conference, reported that at that time, 60% of the home demolitions were clearing demolitions. This um, is primarily what was happening in Gaza at the time, in Rafa, where Rachel was, was staying. And I, I like to point this out to audiences because when you read media reports, uh, which I urge you to do very carefully mm -hmm. and to read a lot of different sources and to question, uh, but when you me read media reports, for example, about Rachel's killing, what you will see oftentimes, uh, the only context they will give about home demolitions is to say that there is, um, a, that the policy is a 10-year-old policy of the Israeli government to destroy the homes of suicide bombers. Sometimes they might add, or people that are, are planning or doing other violence towards Israel. And I would just point out to you that that's the, the only statement that is often made. There's nothing mentioned about the 60% of demolitions that the Israeli Community Against House Demolitions points out to us are clearing demolitions. And uh, I would also point out that families are not compensated. They often have little warning. Uh, the demolitions, they may know uh, five minutes, 15 minutes, maybe if they're lucky, a half hour or so before that their house is going to be demolished. 30% of the demolitions, according to ICAD, are because homes don't have permits. This happens primarily in East Jerusalem, in the greater Jerusalem area, and it's because there is, since 1967, a dual set of laws uh, that is uh, one set for uh, Jew Jewish uh, residents of the, of the area and another set of laws for Palestinians uh, in the area. And the reason for that is because there is a, a, a very definite effort to keep the po po population of Palestinians limited in the Jerusalem area. And uh, Craig will actually, I, I don't know if you'll be able to see the photo, but uh, show a photo of a demolition in East Jerusalem that we actually witnessed uh, that was one of these per, uh, because of no permits. Palestinians try year after year to get permits to build on land that they have owned maybe for uh, decades, maybe for centuries. And they can't add on to structures. They can't um, uh, you know, build something new there. 
uh, sometimes they finally go ahead and build anyway. And when they do, a demolition, they may or may not get a demolition order, but they'll never know when it's going to happen. Some houses have had demolition orders on them for 10 years. And then finally one day uh, they wake up and the bulldozer is there. Uh, so it's a, it's a very unpredictable situation for them. 10% of the demolitions are punitive demolitions. And these are uh, demolitions that are targeted towards the homes of suicide bombers or of other people who may have threatened violence or, or, or have, uh, uh, allegedly are going to commit violence against Israel or have. Um, but I would point out that these are also illegal under international law. It's a form of collective punishment. And I ask Americans, um, when Timothy McVeigh, for example, uh, did the destruction that he did, he wouldn't have considered going up into New England where his family lived and blowing up his parents' house, his sister's house. And this is exactly what's happening in this situation. And Palestinian homes oftentimes have um, multiple families living in them. So it's, it's not even like a family where we might have four or five people affected. It can be as many as 10, 20, 30 um, families. And in fact, um, there are uh, incidences where people have died because the house next door to theirs was demolished and then their house collapsed on top of them. As Rabbi Michael Lerner said in Tikkun Magazine, Inch by inch, dunham by dunham, the steady erosion of Palestinian homes and agricultural land continues. The Palestinians see it happening each day. We ignore it and focus on the public relations statements of the various political leaders and thus don't understand why even now there is so much ongoing anger in Palestine. When Rachel stood there that day with seven other internationals from the US and the UK, between Israeli bulldozers and threatened Palestinian homes. They stood against oppression and for the right and the obligation that I believe we have to resist oppression. They stood for an end to an immoral occupation, the, the most important step that I believe might be taken toward a just and enduring peace for both Israelis and Palestinians. They stood for the human rights of Palestinians and Israelis, for the right of families to be secure in their homes, in their restaurants, on their buses. They stood for self-determination and freedom for the Palestinian people and for our shared humanity across borders and cultures. Rachel believed that the nonviolent direct action that she was doing would make not only Palestinians but also Israelis and Americans more secure by supporting Palestinians who practice nonviolent resistance and by hopefully speeding an end to this conflict that has so damaged Israeli and American images in the world. Rachel stood there that day because the United States and Israeli governments had vetoed a resolution in the United Nations uh, to bring a peacekeeping force to the region after the start of the Second Intifada that was proposed by Mary Robinson the High Commissioner for Human Rights and was vetoed by the United States and Israel. Rachel and other activists went in place of these, um, peace, this peacekeeping force and they continue to go. Rachel stood protesting demolitions that are illegal under international law and that we in the United States in fact contribute to with billions of U.S. tax dollars annually that fund the Israeli military's bulldozers, Apache helicopters, F-16s, and more. And I always point out that Craig and I believe that we in fact contributed uh, to purchasing the Caterpillar D-9R bulldozer that killed our daughter with our own tax dollars that supports this. In her work, Rachel worked with Israeli peace activists as she tried to understand the destruction of the Palestinian water supply. She received guidance from a reservist in the Israeli military, a father of two teenage sons, Danny, whom Craig and I have since met. Danny taught her Hebrew phrases that she should shout through her megaphone when she encountered bulldozer and tank operators. Rachel was held as she died by Alice, who is a Jewish member of ISM from the United Kingdom. And Alice told us uh, later when, when we met with her that she has cousins in Israel that she fears for whenever she hears of a suicide bombing. 
Rachel joined the growing number of people and of Jewish Americans and Israelis who expressed to us that as they work to end the occupation and the violence that it has perpetuated, that they are working to save the soul of Israel. The world has responded to my daughter in many ways. At a vigil just days after Rachel's death, a young woman with beautiful dark hair stood with tears streaming down her face as I approached. I took her hands and she said to me, I lost, I lost all of my family in Palestine. Can I be your daughter? Our earliest emails included ads that were placed in the Israeli newspaper Haaretz by Israeli Jews who understood why Rachel had come to Gaza and understood why she stood before the bulldozer that day. And messages came from other parts of the world. I'm going to close with two of those. The first is from a woman in New York State who wrote, my grandparents fled the pogroms of Russia a hundred years ago and spent decades working for the creation of a Jewish homeland. I'm certain that if they were alive, they would weep for all that is happening there now, as I do. And from a gentleman in the Middle East came this message. I write to you as a parent myself and also as a Muslim who believes passionately in the freedom and dignity of every individual on our earth. It seems to me that we too carelessly forget or disbelieve our shared identity across all times and cultures, when in fact we are one human family desperately in need of peacemakers. And now I will turn things over to Craig and uh, uh, let him take it away. Technically and kind, Craig. Uh, could you guys see some of this? No. No, yes, no. Yeah, right here. Because I had a video, but if you can't see it, and it's mostly talking, and it's of Rachel, the last uh, press conference she gave, and it's a good thing, and we'd like to leave you some time for... But Maybe we could run it right. as people are going out, and they could uh, see the picture. Well, that wouldn't make any difference. Yeah, we can, so yeah, I'll just hear it. Well, it's about... Yeah, you'll have to hear, that's the other test, of course, is the people my age, particularly with my hearing, because uh, it's going to have to go just from the, uh, from my uh, computer speakers, too. So here, we'll give it a try, and uh, hope that it works. This, I'll introduce it for a second. Excuse, excuse me, if the... The center is the primary spot. Could we close this aisle? We sure could. Yeah. yeah, of course. Do whatever you can. Yeah, while you're doing that, I will no, no. sort of explain a little bit about what we're going to try and see here. Um, it's Rachel's last press conference that was given uh, on a rooftop of August Neal's house. We can look at it, and we get the sound up, and we're all quiet. And hopefully you can hear it. And so she'll explain what she's talking about, and that's significant. But her, uh, but if you look at the video, and I'll put it to full screen and talk about it, you can see beyond Rachel and behind her, and that used to be a community in Rafa, that, but there's nothing there anymore. But there used to be houses and shops, and I think even a little green land behind her. You're going to see where they were constructing at the time. She was still alive, a large steel wall. You hear a lot about the wall, but this is probably one you haven't heard about, because the wall you usually hear about is in the West Bank and going through there. This wall is between Rafa, or that part of Palestine that's in the Gaza Strip, and Egypt, and the Egyptian Sinai. So it's a large steel wall that's being uh, built back there when Rachel was still alive. And look at some of the machinery used to build that, because it would give you an uh, idea of the immense size of it. Then beyond that, you can see some, uh, some greenery, some trees and stuff, and that would be the part of Rafa that is in Egypt. So kind of looking at those things, uh, and you might look at Rachel's, tell people to look at Rachel's feet, because she's on top of a house there. And you're going to see, at her feet, you're going to see some rebar. And in the background to uh, your right, her left, you can probably see some other houses and how they're shot full of holes in different places. So that's, that's the community that Rachel's talking from. And if I get it going here, you can hear, or you can see it here, hopefully. 
college or small with the order. I think you'll be able to see, hopefully. And uh, that's the wall. You make sure we got all. Uh oh. It's about two stories high, isn't it? About two and a half. Yeah. Uh huh. And I think it has messed up here by touching something. That is not Rachel, that's Alice, the woman that held Rachel when she died. Rachel will be on in a second. I'm going to close it. But that's typical of what they did. That's Rachel. That's all. Okay.
Well, I hope you could do a little of that. The uh, Unitarian Church in Kansas City, Missouri, just uh, last Tuesday night played the film that had, that had some of this on it. Uh, and a great many people would see that. That had some of that on it? Yes. So it was uh, Yahya Bearcat's yes. film? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That, uh, Is that the I, one that's available? See, I still got the sound somehow. I haven't seen what's available, but probably. Rachel's story. Yeah, yeah. It's called Rachel American Conscience. He's an he's a Palestinian. Yahya Barakat is a Palestinian filmmaker. That um, it was interesting because Craig and I traveled there in September of 2003. We, we needed very much to go to see where Rachel had been. We had intended to go there as soon as she was killed, and then um, learned very soon after that war with Iraq was probably beginning in a couple of days. And in fact. Um, Rachel was killed on the 16th. I think the bombs were falling on the 19th, and uh, so we learned quickly that the American or the American embassy was down to one third staff, so we couldn't go there. And we went in September. And we met young America, or I didn't meet him, but he because he couldn't travel uh, to see us where, from Ramallah, where we were at the time in East Jerusalem, and so it was actually an Israeli a filmmaker who came and and filmed some of what you probably saw of us at that time. It's always hard to see yourself in, in a film. I, I always think when I see it, we looked a little shell-shocked, and <laughs> we probably were. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, actually, these these pictures were taken just a couple of days after what Sydney talked about on our first trip to uh, Gaza, where we wanted to go meet the people that, be, and these are the people that were behind the wall that Rachel was in front of. So this is the Nasrallah family, or that part of it. Actually, the house was lived in by two brothers, an upstairs, downstairs apartment. And this is the older brother who would live downstairs so he could welcome the guests, leading the guests and his family. And right. that's, if you tilt, if you can, tilt the screen down. Mm -hmm. Would that help? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah that's I wish you told me that half. <laughs> is that about right somewhere in there? Much better. Much better. Okay, much better. great. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, so that's in this Rala family, and they are in their garden there, and the garden wall where they were when Rachel was killed. This is their house, the picture's taken about where Rachel was standing when, when she was killed. And uh, like I said, it's two stories there. We get a little closer picture of it. This is the downstairs. This is where the children of Dr. Samir, the older uh, brother, children lived right here, and the younger brother lived up here. This is their bedroom, and you see their little holes there? Those are bullet holes, as the Israeli military would drive past in their armored personnel carriers or their uh, tanks, they would shoot into there. I'm a Vietnam vet. I think if that were really a 50 caliber machine gun, which you can't mount from these vehicles, it would go entirely through the house. But they told us, and we could see from the bullet holes, that the bullets would go through the outside concrete wall, the inside concrete wall of the children's bedroom, and, and then in bed, but stop, in the other wall of the living room. So every night, as, as Rachel wrote about, the uh, family and the children would all sleep in the, in the mm -hmm. parents' back bedroom on the floor. And mm -hmm. that's, that's where they lived. Is that just harassment? Well, it is, but, but I think the purpose, and, and you really have to talk to the Israeli military, and they would have to tell you the truth about the purpose there, uh, I think is to get people to move out. Mm -hmm. And then they'll say, well, the home's, the home's abandoned, yeah. then we can destroy that. Sure. And they would talk about tunnels going into this house and say, well, we have to do that because of the tunnels. Um, but, it, but as you could see in that film where Rachel was there, maybe you couldn't see it unless you were on the ceiling, 
and that <laughs> when Cindy was uh, when uh, Rachel was talking, it's a wholesale dem demolition of all everything there. And of course, uh, if in anything I've read very specifically about the uh, from the IDF about the Nasrallah family, they stopped short of saying there were any tunnels or if they ever thought there were any tunnels under their house or anything like that. They will talk about in general, you know, we have to do that because of the tunnels or because of terrorism or something. But then, and so you get this idea, that's why you did that. Or they say this is a long-standing policy to destroy homes where there are tunnels in them. But they don't say this home had a tunnel in it. And that's a little bit more obvious uh, when in the summer of 2005, the younger brother, his wife, and a baby that wasn't alive when Rachel was born, came to the United States and went on a speaking tour with us, Cindy and I, for about a month. And of course, to come to the United States, you have to have a visa. To get a visa to the United States, you have to go to Tel Aviv, to Israel, to apply for that. Well, this family, this 34-year-old male Muslim Palestinian, uh, was given a visa to walk freely in the streets of Tel Aviv by the Israelis and, and another visa to come and walk in in LA here. So neither the IDF that the Israelis nor the US government ever thought they had, there was anything that they were accusing this family of, even though about six months after Rachel was killed, their homeless made them livable and they were forced out. Did they get back into Palestine? Yeah, it took a little while. people coming out and not being able to get back. Um, it, it took a couple of days, but the border into Egypt, actually, from, from uh, Rafa was open at that time. So it, it, things change day by day. For instance, now, uh, if, if you were maybe married to a Palestinian, but not a Palis didn't have the Palestinian documents, you, we know, we have friends who you know, spouses that have lived in the West Bank, and, and they should, they, if they leave, they won't be able to get back in, and they'll be there illegally uh, after a few months because their visa will run out uh, after three months. But of course, that's Israel making the rules for Palestine. And so, you know, you, as, uh, as the person that I was talking to at the uh, U.S. State Department said, you might ask why the Israelis are making the rules for Palestine there, you know, even if it is. Where do they live at now? They are in, actually, both families. So now, six kids and four adults are living in an apartment in, in Rafa. So, so they stayed there? They stayed in that area. They, when the family you see here was forced out, they then were living in seven different apartments, homes, after that. Of course, the, uh, what did you say, Cindy, about 10% of the... Uh, if Craig goes on and shows you the picture of the whole family, you'll see part of the family then because they, the place they had to live in was too close to the border, but they couldn't find anything else. But then that also was destroyed. So they actually lived through two demolitions in a very short they, time. Yeah, the, while the father was gone, the rest of the family actually was trying to get out of the house while the bulldozer was coming through the wall, which is, you know, sometimes people are shot when they come out or don't get out. So it's very, you know, it's just unmanageable. I was going to talk, excuse me, and I went back. This is the neighborhood they lived in when, when the day we were there. It's probably, given how little you can see, there is an armored personnel carrier that came, I think, just to intimidate us, but would normally be out there. Uh, you can see what the neighborhood, or you might be able to see what the neighborhood would have looked like. It's a very densely populated area. And then the, the land was destroyed. So this was in the process. Would have looked like this a few months before we got there. Now it's rubble. That's a part of the neighbor's house, uh, the part of the woman's, uh, I think upstairs balcony, but it may have been a lower balcony. She would like to sit out there and have a little bit of tea in the afternoon, and she was sitting there sipping tea. Nothing happening in the neighborhood when she was shot through the head and killed by an Israeli sniper, mm -hmm. who would have been out on the border over in here. Mm -hmm. So um, what do you do if you're living under that sort of threat? And uh, this, like this family was. And you can imagine, it's not like your neighbor's going to come over and talk to you. By the time we got there, this family's living on, a, on at the end of a road. There's nobody else living on that road. The homes on one side were totally destroyed. Beyond them, to the border, which had just been a neighborhood, those homes are all destroyed, and nobody's out there. Nobody will walk out. The children aren't going to have people over to play. The relatives won't see them. If you leave to go to school, you don't know whether you can get back again. You don't, you don't know if you might be shot on the way or just just blocked. So the, 
So they tried to figure out just how to live in that situation, and our friend Hallett would say in his English as a second language, the answer was the rabbitses, which is plural for rabbit. They went out and uh, got a book on raising rabbits. They built a couple of hutches, bought three rabbits, and raised them as pets. And as he kind of grinned and said, in 10 months we have 30 rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see uh, little Iman, she was about six, months, uh, six years old when Cindy took this picture, and she's there petting a rabbit. And that is uh, pretty much how the family survived in terms of their humanity, is uh, mourning. Once in the morning and once in the evening, they would take the whole family out and take care of these rabbits and work on their ears and, and everything. Um, I can't take too long to go through all the slides I've got here, and, and so maybe you should interrupt me in place and we'll just kind of do a talk and but answer questions as well. This is the entire family, except like every American family, all of your family, so it's somebody that's not at Thanksgiving or everything. In this case, it's Kyle that is the one taking the picture. They are out on the ground where Rachel was killed, was looking back toward the border by this time. This, this picture was taken two years after Rachel was killed, and they're trying to have a little uh, memorial service. It's safer out there uh, this time. They had, they had the possibility of walking out and then finding where their home was and where Rachel would have been. Now they could figure out and kind of guess where their home was, and they decided they had to guess right because they found a small piece of tile that they recognized as coming from their kitchen. But the rest of it, the roads, the neighbors' houses, everything else is destroyed, so there's no way to really fix where you are anymore, even though it used to be a neighborhood with streets and all that. There would have been streets behind the family. Uh, they're holding candles. The candles aren't lit, most of them, because Kala's hand was shaking too much to strike a match. And right after the picture was taken, the Israeli military drove up and started shooting around the children's feet. And so they left. Here's a map, and maybe it's too close, of Israel, but uh, starting from your left to right, is the, in the blue, is Israel as it was laid out by the UN in 1946, and in the kind of khaki is, uh, is Palestine territory. Then when Israel declared itself a state and the war broke out, uh, they then pushed back those borders, that Israel did, to making uh, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip being part of Palestine and the rest, Israel. And so then that lasted until 1967, when Israel, of course, overran uh, the Gaza Strip and, in fact, the, uh, the Egyptian Sinai, the West Bank, and not on this map, the Golan Heights. This map over here, this piece of Swiss cheese, is the way the West Bank will look when the wall is completed. And you can see how it goes well in you probably can't see where the actual Green Line or the West Bank legally is, but it's well out here, and the wall goes way in to, to encompass the colonies that the Israelis are building on Palestinian land and make that wall so that that then would be de facto a part of Israel. It also ends up dividing the uh, West Bank into many sectors, and the expert on all this is here today, um, so Jeff Halford can talk about that. Uh, much better than I can. But here's a picture, another one, all the good pictures is something Cindy took, but this is one east of, of Jerusalem, and it shows the wall going through here, and I was talking about it since Cindy and I are from the Midwest in Iowa, and in, in the United States, and probably just by the way we settled the land and gave away land to settlers who had to live on it, if you go through the West or through the Midwest here, the farmers are out living generally on their land. But in Palestine, they live in, in small little villages that are close, and then at, and during the day, they'll walk out to where the land they own. So if you put in a wall, like it's here, right next to the village, which is over in this and over on this side, you can separate all the population from their trees and their land with just a simple wall. And so that is, a, this picture really is a good graphic, good show of it, the strategy of trying to take land but not taking population, and Jeff, I'm sure, will talk about that strategy as we. Where, where is that again? This is east of Jerusalem, east of East Jerusalem. So we were actually going from Bethlehem, which is part of the West Bank, up to Ramallah and to a little place called Belain, and I'll, I'll try to talk to you about that. Which is up. You went to Ramallah, hung the left, up towards the border, you get to Belain. 
And we are driving that way because we have Palestinians with us, and they wouldn't be allowed to go into uh, Jerusalem. So it would be, I don't know, maybe a 20-mile drive or something like that, but it, it was at yet, and uh, you know, maybe about 60 miles or something like that. Beautiful, but slow. And of course, cumbersome. We went to Belain because there is a small town and the, the Israelis are still building the wall at Belain. And uh, here we are walking through the place. There's a protest going on on Friday afternoon, as there is every Friday afternoon at Belain. And, and this is where the wall is. So it was a different day that, that day because we could actually not only get up to where they were building the wall, which generally people were turned back at that, at that point, but we could actually go beyond it to the land that the uh, Palestinians had. It was, it was mostly uh, olive trees. You can see the olive grove there. And you can see what the, hopefully, you can see what the Israeli military did to the, the olive grove. This, they basically cut it all up here, but if you can't see the screen. And you can see here the owner of that olive grove walking up. And you can see behind him the reason that that wall is going in where it is, because they're building this colony, this settlement. On, on this land. I think with a, a little picture that's a little farther away, it's hard to tell here. Here's the colony, and here in a line back here, that's actually where the border would be with Israel. So if all these buildings were back here on the ridge behind, they would be legal. But because they're out here by international law, of course, if you are a, if, if your government, your country, has occupied another country, it's illegal to move your population onto the occupied a land, but Israel is doing exactly that, and and those are the buildings that are going in there. What's interesting and uh, unique, maybe, about this is it's not only illegal under international law, but these particular buildings are illegal under Israeli law, because they don't have a, a permit to put put the buildings in there. So, um, so there's been this this commitment to keep that land and to stop the wall and to keep those buildings from, from going in there. And that's got taken two, two sort of routes. They went to court, the Palestinians went to Israeli court, and about a month, month and a half ago, the Israeli high court came back and said, yes, the buildings are illegal, and at least some of them, two of them, were, were torn down. And I'm not sure what they consider buildings, because it would look to me like there are a whole lot more than two buildings there, but some of them are connected. so. Uh, so I'm not sure what went down. But they were just, there were some destroyed, and also the court said that you have to build a road to go through the wall that will allow you, allow the Palestinians to come over onto their land. Now we've seen that in other towns, and there may be a road, but then there's a gate, and the gate never comes open. And so, you know, we'll believe that when we see it, but at least some of the building was destroyed, at least for the time being. Now this man is talking to Cindy and telling us about the other part of that, which was this, Continuous dedication to non-violently oppose mm -hmm. the taking of their land. And, and that was largely because they wanted their children to see something, a non-violent process. So, like I said, every Friday people would come to, to this spot, and you can see here the group, for instance, because it happened to be a really nice day and the Israeli military was not trying to break up this demonstration on this particular day, Here's a group of women sitting around with Cindy. There's a woman there who's got a plastic water drug. She's pounding, drumming on it. And the 10-year-olds, I think Cindy was saying, uh, girls would be calling out the songs. Now, we don't know Arabic, so Cindy, I think, is just clapping along. <laughs> I was sitting with the guys, you know, because it's sort of, you don't mix up the sexes that much. And you can see this building behind us. And uh, although I'm not in the picture, I probably took it. The building behind there, part of it was when they found out the Israelis did not have a building permit or a permit for their building, they said, well, wait a minute, we're the ones that have, legally have title this, we'll build the building there and it'll be permitted. So they put in a, what they, uh, essentially a mobile home, and that was destroyed right up at that. So they put in another one, and that was destroyed the next day. But then somebody went up and talked to the officer in charge from the Israelis and said, well, they're not permanent structures, so we just destroyed it. So, okay, you know, get that figured out. So they came over the concrete, the concrete blocks, and they put up this small building, which would be constructed like they would 
do all their houses, but it is a permanent construction. As far as I know, that still stands. Mm -hmm. Now, when I was sitting with these guys talking, uh, the person that was, uh, I don't know any Arabic either, so, you know, took an interpreter, and the guy sitting next to me on my right, who was interpreting, turned to me and he says, you know, this is very difficult. He said, because I don't understand any Arabic. He said, I'm Israeli. I live just outside of Tel Aviv, and I came here from the west, and since the wall isn't completed, I could walk up from the west, everybody else is coming from the east. He said, but the guy that you're talking to from the town uh, is speaking to me in Hebrew, and then I'm translating to you in, uh, into English. And he said, so you're the only one that's speaking his native language. But I thought that was really indicative of, uh, of what was going on there in that town. Mm -hmm. You know, we're about out of time. If I've got a couple of pictures, let's see what we've got going here. I'm going to skip over some statistics, but let me tell you, this last week, 28 Palestinians killed and 44 wounded mm -hmm. by the IDF. Mm -hmm. I want to introduce you to Arik Ashman, Rabbi Arik Ashman, because uh, people a lot of times say, well, what was Rachel doing standing in front of a bulldozer? How stupid is that? Arik was arrested a few years ago uh, in charge with interrupting the government operation. What he was doing is standing in front of an Israeli military bulldozer and preventing the destruction of a Palestinian home. Now, he was doing that in East Jerusalem. He was arrested instead of, uh, instead of crushed. But he's here standing on a street. You can see a woman, I think, down here crying. That woman's a relative of the owner of this home that's being destroyed on the day that we were there uh, in East Jerusalem. These people, they've got three friends of Rachel's. Rachel had a great desire to have, uh, to, to have a sister city project between our hometown of Olympia, Washington, and Rafa. These people, along with two others, were in Rafa for about two months uh, over the turn of this last year, so in December and January of uh, 2005 and six, And they are in the uh, Rachel Corey Cultural Center for Children and Youth and working on with others. They're speaking among themselves right now, but they were working with about 35 others in trying to bring that uh, sister city project here. And I think I'll close, because we're running out of town here, with this mother-daughter picture, which I think is just gorgeous. But the mother here is Oma Ahmed. She's Muslim. She lives in the town of Rafa. The daughter is Laura Gordon. She's Jewish, and she comes from Pittsburgh. <laughs> and uh, Laura actually was uh, went to Israel on birthright. Israel was traveling around Israel. Somebody talked her into going down to Rafa for a day. She said she sort of saw Rachel running through the back of the room when she was meeting other people. Then she heard that Rachel was killed and heard really ugly things from the people around her when she was up in Haifa about Rachel. And so she called her father and said, Dad, you know where that young American was killed? I'm going to go down there. So, you know, here's his father who sent his daughter off to the Birthright Israel program, and all of a sudden she takes a right turn and takes off down to Rafa, where she stayed for 10 months. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Are any of our congressional representatives a voice, a true voice for the Palestinians? There are a few who seem to vote pretty well. I don't know about a voice that really comes out there, but... Um, <coughs> I, 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 we've done a lot of work in Congress. Craig has actually spent more time there physically than I have. We pay quite a lot of attention. Um, I think it'll be really interesting to see what Dennis Kucinich starts to say. I think he may be the voice that comes the closest to... There are people like Jim Moran. Uh, in, there, there are people that will speak about this. Uh, but it's it's a very uh, a kind of unsafe or has been considered a pretty unsafe thing to do to show much uh, very direct support. Um, one woman I'm thinking of in California, if you watch hearings ever on C-SPAN, uh, there was some there are these resolutions that uh, continue to come before the Congress that are always very much in support of Israel, pretty much no matter what. Very rarely will there be anything that um, even touches on the Palestinian, um, the hardship and the, the, all of that situation. Uh, but I have this Lois Capps, I think, who was a congresswoman whose, um, whose constituents really educated her, really brought her along, and she, she was open to it. 
And I have seen her, I did have see her stand before a committee and make, you know, make a statement at the same time that there were a lot of people speaking in favor of this resolution that was supporting Israel that has no impact except to create bad feelings. Most resolutions don't, most of them don't have any impact, but they create very bad feelings. And, um, but the money goes through all this. Well, the money is a separate thing that's yeah. attached to other bills and so forth, but these resolutions are generally just in support of Israel. But I did see Lois Capps. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've seen Jim McDermott of Washington mm -hmm. State make some statements, so there are some people. I, I've heard that the Israeli newspapers are much more, much more uh, objective. They give a broader picture of this than our U.S. Yeah. I yeah. urge you to That's go, if, you, if you're if you not familiar with Haaretz, yes. uh, it's an Israeli newspaper mm -hmm. that, I, actually I'm on a number of listers, but almost every day I look at articles mm -hmm. that are in Haaretz. And um, certainly, uh, you'll see website. different points of view there. Yeah, you can get an English version of that. Uh, the Guardian out of London is better. Mm -hmm. And Jim McDermott's chief of staff is telling me that I've forgotten what it's called, but there's an English paper out of uh, Lebanon. The it, Star, the Daily Star. The Star, exactly. And and she says that's one of the ones that she clips for Congressman McDermott, mm -hmm. which the, uh, tells you a lot that that's mm -hmm. the clip. Um, Washington report on the Middle East lists uh, Congress people who have gotten money from Israeli PACs. And you can also on that list see the ones that have gotten nothing. And I think that that's probably significant. Mm -hmm. They also keep some, some lists of voting on there. Yeah. So uh, Jim Leach, I think from Iowa, Eastern Iowa, has a pretty good voting record, for instance. And it's, it's interesting to see. There, um, we had a resolution, uh, if some of you are aware, and some of you, I'm sure, lobbied for it, uh, to calling for an independent U.S. investigation into Rachel's killing. It was HCR 111. It died at the end of the 108th Congress, at the end of 2004. It had 78 uh, uh, signers uh, in the House of Representatives. We couldn't get it introduced in the Senate, even by, by our Washington State senators. but. Um, uh -huh. 78. Our Congressman Brian Baird said that he thought that was remarkable, mm -hmm. that we got yes. that number. Yeah. Because most of the resolutions that show any kind of, um, it might indicate criticism of Israel, might get 25 or 30. Those are probably the 25 or 30 most courageous uh, people in the House. But we did get 78, so we know that you know lobbying and educating and building relationships and that sort of thing can make a difference. Just Anyone have to make a burning one. question? Yeah. Well, I don't have a question. She's talking about lobbying. Maybe you all do lobbying. I've not been successful to see my senators, but I go to see representatives. I live near Washington, D.C., so I, I can go see them all. You can get in and see your representatives, and don't be discouraged if you know you, you show up and they say, oh, I'm sorry, they're not here. Just keep, keep going back. We've, we've found you go to group, you go to an individual, they'll talk to you. I don't know what they'll hear, but just keep, keep going at it. I mean, I've got the well, band to be in here, but go locally, wherever you live, because they're spending time in their local offices, and go talk to them. And 78 is remarkable. <laughs> whatever you said. Virginia. East Iowa Presbytery is working hard to raise money to send our representatives to uh, Israel and Palestine, and that will be um, March 31st and to April 10th. 2007. So if anyone wants to uh, contribute to the <laughs> cause yeah. of sending representatives to, because that's their only way of really getting informed. And I know we have to bring them back. effort that's underway in Iowa and mm -hmm. I, I think what they do is I think try to take a, a senior staffer right and it's a it's a very it's made a difference um, Jim Leach Jim Leach's staffer went we, we worked with his office we know that made a difference her name was Naomi we know it made yeah. a difference an and I think that they are open I mean if people are willing to do the fundraising my understanding is they're open to you 
you know, going to your congressperson and encouraging them to send a staffer with this group. Sure. Uh, so mm -hmm. I forget the amount. Do you know the amount that it takes to send each no, person? I don't. Yeah. Well, hey, we well, thank you for the voices of the